My name is Roy Levin. Today is December 6, 2016, and I'm at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, where I will be interviewing Ron Rovest for the ACM's Turing Award Winners Project. Good afternoon, Ron, and thanks for taking the time to speak with me today. Good afternoon. I want to start by um, talking about your background and how you got into computing. Uh, when did you first get interested in computing? Interesting story. So I grew up in Schenectady, New York, where my dad was an electrical engineer working at GE Research Labs and uh, in a suburb called Niskayuna, which is sort of a high-tech suburb of, of Schenectady. And uh, they had a lot of interesting classes, both within the school and, and uh, after school. And one of the classes I took, uh, probably as a junior, was a computer programming class back in about 1964. Uh, from a fellow that worked at the GE Research Labs. Uh, I think his name was Marv Allison, who taught it. And he had a uh, programming language he'd invented and wanted to teach to the local high school students. And so he would come after, after high school and we would sit around and, and uh, hear about computer programming and get these sheets, you know, with the marked squares for the letters and, and write a program. And he would take them, it was once a week, and he would take the sheets away um, at, at the end of the class. And then a week later, he would have them punched up and to get the outputs out. And of course, there were bugs. So it took forever just to write a little program that computed the area of a triangle or something, as I remember. But that was my first introduction to computer programming. Aha, uh -huh. that's great. About how many kids were involved in that? It was probably about a dozen. It was a great. Great. I don't and remember the name of the language. It was a, uh, some little funky language he invented. I'm sure. Um, and, and did you guys work together at all on those, those things, or were they They're all solo individual projects? projects. Was, everybody had the same assignment, but it was a solo project. I see. The one I remember was computing the area of a triangle given the three sides or something like uh -huh. that. And that was, you don't remember how many weeks it took to get them? It get was probably about six weeks to get that done, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. So that's, that's your sort of earliest involvement with, with computing yes. as, a, as roughly a junior in, in high yeah, school. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was sort of interested in math and science at the time, and, and you know, computers were starting to become, you know, more known, you know, and occurred in the popular press, but I didn't have any involvement with them personally uh -huh. until then. And um, were there other things that happened while you were in high school that were? Not that I remember. Uh, it was just a strong math program, and, and, uh, which is, of course, good for a computer science background, but uh, in terms of actual involvement with computers, I don't remember anything else. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then you went off to to college, you went to Yale as an undergraduate. Yes, yeah, so in uh, 65, I graduated from high school, went to Yale as an undergraduate. Uh, wasn't sure at the time what I wanted to major in. So freshman year, Yale's a good liberal arts school and I didn't know whether I wanted to do law or psychology or mathematics. Uh, eventually decided on mathematics. Uh, it gave me the most freedom to explore other things too. Um, but there was no computer science department in Yale at the time. And uh, so I took some CS-like classes from the engineering school but uh, uh, got a degree in mathematics. And did you think that you would continue to be involved with computing or that mathematics was going to be your career at that point or maybe you didn't even didn't know what you were gonna do? I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, although I very much enjoyed the work I did uh, with computers. I supported myself uh, part-time uh, working for Professor Richard Ruggles of the economics department uh, there and uh, did some programming for the Econometrica Society. They were computing price indices in South America and things like this. So I was going to the Yale Computer Center and dealing with decks of cards to, to compute price indices here and there, and that, that was sort of fun. Oh, so you had to punch your own cards in those days. Had to punch your own cards <laughs> in those days, yeah. yeah. And there were also some good uh, computer classes. There was a class on the, the MAD programming language of the Mich Michigan Algorithm Decoder, mm -hmm. which, was, uh, which was fun. Interesting. Um, so as, a, as an undergraduate, um, computing was uh, sort of a sideline. Um, you were you were focused on on math. Did you have any particular areas within math that you were that particularly uh, interested you or turned you on? So I think the math was actually sort of drab compared to the CS stuff that I was doing. I enjoyed uh -huh. the CS stuff more. Uh, there were classes on you know how to build a computer, how to program computers. Uh, the math classes were more analysis and and uh, topology and things like that, which uh, I found I frankly less interesting, which is probably why I didn't go into math uh, as, a, as a career longer term. I found the, the, the tangibility of computers, the ability to, to program them, to get them to do things uh, more exciting. Going back for a moment to uh, pre-college, pre uh, did you like to build things uh, as a kid or uh, in, was it 
maybe not the same kind of building, but. Um, I don't know, I had the usual assortment of things that the kids have, you know, chemistry sets and things like that. Um, you know, building elect electromagnets and whatever, you know, but I, nothing uh, computer-like. Um, so I, I wasn't a builder in the sense of building tree houses. My brother specialized in that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I guess it'd be interesting to, if you can reflect for a minute on what it was about building computer programs um, or in general using computers that you found intriguing or stimulating at that time. Yeah, I guess it was the logic involved, you know, just sort of thinking through the, the you know, sort of simulating in your head what the computer would do, uh, think, thinking about the, lo the logic of, of the control, um, some of the combinatorics. It was, it was uh, a style of math and, and uh, thinking that I enjoyed. Okay, okay. So after, after uh, Yale, you went on to get a, an advanced degree. Uh, was that the next year, or was there a break? Yeah, when I finished uh, at Yale in 69, uh, then I moved directly to Stanford graduate program. Uh, so I uh, entered the computer science department, PhD program mm -hmm. uh, there, and uh, uh, which was a new program at the time. It had only been founded, I think, in 65. So there'd only been a, a few uh, graduates through a, a PhD at the time. Uh, I was just getting going. They were still hiring faculty and, and so on too, but there was a, a great uh, set of faculty there. Uh, Bob Floyd was my PhD advisor. Mm -hmm. Don Knuth was there, Zohar Mana. I also worked a lot with David Klarner and Vashak Shavathal who were visiting and doing, they were visiting mathematicians actually, doing a lot of combinatorics and I worked with them. Um, and uh, a lot of great students, I mean, Bob Tarzan, Vaughn Pratt, uh, a lot of other people were there at the same time I was. So it was, a, it was a exciting department at the time. Kind of a who's who of computing yeah, in some ways. Um, how is it that, that uh, Bob Floyd became your advisor? Do you remember? I don't remember how that evolved, actually. It's a great question. Um, I remember very much liking the algorithms course he taught. Mm -hmm. uh, he was teaching, you know, heap sword and other things, and he just had a beautiful way of explaining things. Uh, so I, I enjoyed his teaching style, and it, that must have drifted into an advisory thing somehow, but I don't actually recall how that, uh, how that happened. Okay. It was a fairly small department. Roughly how many students would you say? Uh, at the time, there might have been 40 students. I don't know. So you knew everybody pretty knew much. Everybody pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and did you actually end up working with Bob other than on your, on your thesis? Um, that is, with, with, were you involved in research work that he so was So I doing? did research other than with, with Bob. I, we, the, uh, one of the early pieces I did with him was the linear time median finding algorithm uh, with, with the Bob and, and Manny Blum and Vaughn Pratt and Bob Tarzan. Uh, that actually arose from a conversation Bob Floyd had had with, with uh, Manny Blum at Berkeley. I never met Manny at, at the time the paper was published even. Um, <laughs> but uh, he said, here's an initial idea, and he had some nonlinear ideas, and we sort of refined them and put, made them, pushed them a little further and made them linear. Uh, so that was one piece of research I did at, at Stanford. I also worked on uh, some enumeration questions with David Kleiner, enumerating polyominoes, how many polyominoes can you make with n, n tiles? Uh, what are the asymptotics of that? Um, I also worked quite a bit up at the uh, Stanford AI lab, up in the hills behind the campus, uh, in part because it was interesting work and in part because it was DARPA funded and came with a deferment. And as you know, the Vietnam War was uh, right. uh, uh, underway then, and so this would allow me to defer thinking about that issue. Um, so I worked on the uh, Stanford CART project uh, when I was there and worked with Bruce Bumgart. And uh, we were trying to get this, the cart to drive around the parking lot uh, without hitting in anything. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, interesting resonance for the things that are happening today with self-driving vehicles and so on too. At the time, the computers were so underpowered and our technology was so feeble, we couldn't succeed at what we were trying at, at the time, but uh, we tried. <laughs> so that was really, that list of names you rattled off a minute ago was really pretty impressive. I mean, think of how many Turing Award winners there are in that, in, in that group now. I mean, it was the early days, and it was, it was fun times, yeah, it was uh, yeah, good that's, people. That's really quite something. Um, did you have a, the opportunity to work with, with Don Knuth? So I talked with Don Knuth off and on, uh, in particular my thesis work on uh, uh, search uh, algorithms for, for uh, associative search, and uh, he had some very helpful remarks there, but he was not my formal advisor, he was a, mm -hmm. just a, somebody I talked with now and then. We also talked, I also talked with him about some of his exercises. I remember I had a solution to one of his exercises. He said, aha, I, I, that's going to go in the book. So he did. <laughs> well, those books were, were kind of all the rage at that, at, at that time. Yeah, right? He was, they're, they're he was still actively involved in that. Very much valuable references, yes. Yes, indeed. 
Although it's still amazing to look back at what his original plan was for those books and how ambitious it was, and in, I guess in some ways maybe naive. I, I think he, well, yeah, the field was exploding <laughs> in ways he didn't expect, I guess, yes. but uh, I think he's still working on them, right? He's had some recent folios come out recently, so the plan is still there and it's still being acted on, although I think he's probably uh, mellowed a bit in his expectations. I would, I would hope covering so. Everything, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. Yeah, so your, your work, your thesis work, as you mentioned, was uh, in analysis of algorithms. And of course, um, Bob had this, this class and Don, Don was interested in those things as well. Um, so it, it sounds like you gravitated to that area relatively early on. It was an area I, I enjoyed, uh, the, the analysis of algorithms. It was uh, sort of concrete, uh, you can take a problem. You know, as, as, as you know, you just sort of take a problem, look, try to devise a good algorithm for it and figure out what the analysis is. My thesis in particular was on algorithms for associative search. So you're given a set of binary words and you're given a search query, which is a partially specified binary word, and you efficiently want to find all the words that match, uh, and so on, too. Mm -hmm. The whole area of, I guess, what gets labeled analysis of algorithms is one that, that started out very concrete and then kind of mushroomed out into, into more theoretical issues and you know, eventually, I guess, into complexity theory uh, in some ways. But where would you place yourself sort of on the spectrum there of, of different kinds of analysis and so I very much like the concrete analysis. I mean, the, the complexity theory issues I, I've thought about and did some work with Andy Yao on K-headed automata and things like that, but my uh, preference is much more for concrete algorithms that uh, work on problems that, that people care about. Uh, mm -hmm. And so trying to take a problem that has some real-world impact and, and uh, find, find a good algorithm for it. And would you in include probabilistic analysis in that, in that uh general sphere as I well. I don't do so much of that. I do a little bit now. Not more recently, I'm thinking more about probabilistic algorithms and algorithms for statistical approaches uh, and some of the work I do on voting and so on too. But back then, I didn't do too much of that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you graduated from, from Stanford in 73? 73, mm -hmm. yeah. And then you did a postdoc. Then I did a postdoc. So then I went to Paris for a year. Uh, so two of my colleagues, um, Gilles Kahn and Jean Vimain, were at Stanford at the time as well. And they said, uh, Ron, when you're finished with your PhD, why don't you come work with us at INRIA, which was uh, just north of uh, Versailles at the time and outside of Paris. And uh, I said, uh, sure, why not? And, and uh, I knew a little bit of French. I'd had three years of high school and, and uh, a couple of classes in college and so on too. So I figured I could probably cope with the French. And uh, my wife and I said, yeah, this will be fun for a year. So we'll, we'll go do that. And I uh, went there. I would, the one thing that was a big surprise to me was that the working language was, in fact, French at the lab. I had expected English for okay. some reason. I, we never talked about that. So I, that was uh, totally exhausting and draining for the first three months I'm sure to, to, to uh, get used to that. But uh, eventually, I managed to, to, to work there. And we uh, worked on a variety of algorithmic uh, questions there, uh, lower, lower bounds. I worked with uh, Jean Vimon, the Ender Rosenberg conjecture, and things like this. So it was a uh, productive time. Also just a great time to have a postdoc in Paris. Yeah, I can believe that. That would be a great time. Was um, the style of, uh, of uh, work as it went on at, at INRIA uh, similar or different to uh, what you had experienced as a, as a graduate student? It was, I guess, somewhat different. There was no AI component there at all. It was mm -hmm. all theory, really. Uh, and it was more formal and, and formal languages kind of thing. So. Uh, um, there, there was a lot of work that was more, th more theoretical than the style I'd seen. It was uh, less algorithmic, but it was, uh, by and large, it was fairly similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was a good, uh, good team of people to talk to. And I learned a lot of things about different styles of computer science there. Were there distinct labs or, or groups that were uh, within the computing aspect? Yeah, the, the there, were, there were different buildings. Batima Wheat was the one I was in. It was Building 8, uh, and, and uh, so that was more theory and, and algorithms. Uh, and there were a, lot, a number of other buildings, which uh, I don't know what it went all, all of them. Um, were there um, what, roughly how many people? I'm just trying to get a sense of a, the size of the group. And what uh, it was like. The theory group there might have been 15 people or so at the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, good bunch. Yeah, good, a good bunch. bunch. And yeah. Were there other postdocs there at the same time? I don't recall that there were. Uh, I think it was mostly uh, local French working there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then after your, your postdoc, you went back, came back to the U.S. and, and went to MIT, right? Yeah. So uh, the, it was interesting searching for a job while I was a postdoc in Paris. So I sort of arranged one big tour of the country, looking at ver a variety of places, trying to figure out what to do next. And I 
Dr. Sar um, Carnegie Mellon and MIT and, and a bunch of other places, uh, Sandia Laboratories and so on, um, and uh, uh, tried to figure out where to go and decided upon MIT. So when the postdoc was over in the fall of 74, I joined the MIT faculty in the computer science department, well, the uh, uh, CS department uh, as part of the lab for computer science. Actually, it wasn't called the lab for computer science quite then. It was Project Mac it was at the still time. Project still Project Mac in those and it was days, only, yes. I think it was the first year I was there, maybe it changed over to lab for computer science. And now it's the computer science and AI lab. They've changed their name again. But every, every couple of decades, right? Yes, yes. Um, and roughly how big was, was uh, well, Project Mac at that time? I don't recall how many people there were. It was uh, in a building in Tech Square that had other tenants in it, so it was probably about three or four floors of the, of the building, each of which might have had uh, 60 people in it or something. So maybe that's you know, a couple hundred people um, max. It's, I, I, it wasn't my job to know these numbers at the time. I don't know. <laughs> no, <laughs> just a know. sense of what the organization yeah, was I mean, like. It sounds the, like it was the, a lot bigger than Stanford. The CIA was, yeah, a lot, yeah. well, the, yeah, it was bigger in some ways than Stanford. Yeah, the CIA was on one floor of the building. Uh, um, Xerox had some lawyers on another floor of the building. It was a you know, mixed-use build, mixed building, so it was, um, and the uh, theory group occupied the major portion of one of the floors. And so Albert Meyer and Mike Fisher and, and uh, Von Pratt and, and a lot of other people were part of the theory group at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, when, you, when you came to MIT, other than teaching, which I'm sure they immediately put you to work doing, um, what was your research focus at that point? So I started off uh, writing proposals to NSF on algorithms in general, and, and in fact, I guess it, originally there was an umbrella grant that Albert Meyer had that covered a lot of the, the work on theory, a lot of algorithms. And uh, I was intrigued by P equals NP and circuit complexity and things like that. I was, I was wondering whether you could prove that P was different than NP by uh, proving circuit lower bounds, which is still the dream of lots of computer scientists. It just mm -hmm. hasn't happened yet, and we've learned a lot about that style of, of uh, argument, but it just doesn't, hasn't worked yet. We know better why certain kinds of arguments won't work. So that was some of the things I was thinking about. Um, and uh, it wasn't too long before I got interested in some of the crypto stuff. That happened uh, a little later, but uh, not right away. Uh, and I was teaching, bus busy doing that, uh, right away, teaching algorithms courses and learning how to teach for the first couple of years. Was it mostly um, individual work and work perhaps with students, or were you collaborating with other members of the faculty? members of the faculty at that time? Um, so I started supervising theses right away and, and talking about string searching algorithms and other things with, with students and supervising, uh, supervising theses. Um, uh, collaboration with other faculty, there was a lot of group discussion. The theory group had, a, and has always had, a great uh, sort of spirit to it and a lot of people collaborating together over, over a, a variety of topics. Uh, we've grown, it's a much bigger group now than it was, but even then it was, it was a uh, great uh, esprit de corps and people talking about common problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that led, I would guess, pretty pretty quickly to the, the work that you ended up having quite a long time uh, being involved with, namely the crypto work. Um, yeah, the crypto work started in, in um, 76 when the Diffie-Hellman paper was published. Right. Uh, and and uh, so we, I had a graduate student at the time, Steve Boyack, who uh, showed me this paper by Wh Witt and Marty and said, uh, hey, Ryan, you might find this interesting. And so I did. Uh, we had been talking, uh, Steve and I had been talking about his work, which was on um, crypto-related things, sort of one-way functions like uh, objects uh, in the matrix space. So sort of, you know, what, get, what uh, matrices over GF2 are there that are easier to compute one way than another. And so he sort of had a, a crypto flavor to it. But uh, so he was he had an ear out for those kinds of things and, and saw the Diffie-Hellman paper and, said, and asked me to take a peek at it. And I, I did and, and said, oh, this is very interesting. And uh, there's a nice open problem here. It's really a beautiful paper uh, and, and uh, lays out the, the ideas of public key cryptography, but doesn't have implementations. And at the time, uh, Adi and Len were uh, in offices next, next to mine. The lab for computer, they, they were in the, in the math department. Uh, Adi was uh, uh, co-teaching with me, in fact, in the algorithms course. So we were, uh, um, seeing, I was seeing him a lot, and uh, Len was also uh, a friend and, and nearby in an office. So we, uh, we collaborated a lot. I said, hey guys, you know, this is an interesting problem. Should we talk about this a bit? And uh, Adi and I uh, spent some time devising initial approaches, which Len was quick to show us didn't work. Uh, and so we had quite a 
back and forth for a while trying to come up with uh, something that might meet the specs of, of Diffie and Hillman. So it was very much motivated by the desire to make real, practical, um, this idea that had, had shown up in that, in that famous paper. Yeah, the, pap famous the, paper. the paper itself was, was, was laid, laid out the, uh, the arguments for, for wanting to do something like this, both theoretically uh, saying, you know, here's interesting questions, can you do these kinds of things? And, and practically, if you could, here's the kinds of things you could do with them and, and uh, you know, talk to your stockbroker privately with his public key and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it, was, it was a beautifully written paper. It was, it was a motivation for our work. But it really wasn't clear to us that you could do something like this. It was uh, uh, you know, an open question. You know, we, we, and we did actually get frustrated at times and say, well, maybe we can prove that this is impossible, that you can't tell somebody how to encrypt without thereby telling them how to decrypt as, as, as well. Um, but uh, we failed at that and ended up coming, <laughs> with, coming up with a proposal that uh, still stands today. Exactly. So um, you mentioned just a little while before that you would uh, had some interest in, in P equals NP, and that reminds me of the, uh, I guess, pretty well-known picture of the three of you, Adi and you and, and Len, standing in an office with a blackboard behind you on which is sort of prominently written P equals NP. Yeah, that was um, a joke. Is there a story there? Yeah, there is a story there, yeah. Some, somebody, this was after we did the work on RSA, and so somebody wanted a picture for, for a paper. And uh, so uh, before the picture was taken, I think it was I that wrote the P equals, therefore P equals NP yes. on the board, and, and uh, sort of a joke uh, to those that were in, in the computer science field. Uh, there. And, and the photographer, of course, didn't know anything. And, and actually very few people notice it when these look at it and say, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow the argument that led to the therefore was hidden by your back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was a joke. We didn't have any uh, proofs then, of course. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So the, the RSA paper uh, was, was appeared in early 78, do I recall correctly? So the first, uh, so, so the, the uh, Diffie-Hellman paper appeared in 76. Mm -hmm. The invention of RSA and sort of the, the figuring out the details and how it worked was, was 77. And uh, at the time we were uh, trying to assess, is it secure, is it, uh, you know, does it, does it make sense, does it work? Um, and that process continued towards later in, in 77, uh, in particular with a publication by Martin Gardner of his column in Scientific American. He had this wonderful column called Mathematical Games, which uh, many mm -hmm. computer scientists cut their teeth on and uh, was, was, was uh, sort of bread and butter reading for lots and lots and lots of people. Um, and he just, he, we had contacted him um, to uh, see what he knew about factoring, because factoring was a, sort of this arcane subspecialty in mathematics, and not too many people actually did research in it. And so we thought he might have known some of the people that worked on these kinds of weird questions. Uh, and he got all excited about our proposal and wanted to write a column about that, so he did. And that was really sort of the first publication of the of the paper uh, in, a, in a widely accessible manner. There was also a, a memo that um, we wrote for the Lab of Computer Science that described it. And that came out, um, well, it was published earlier, but um, wasn't there, there was uh, an issue with the distribution of that. Uh, and the crypto wars are still going on. They started back then. Uh, and the crypto wars were the you know, questions to whether you know, working in cryptography was um, in, in, ac in academia, was it the natural, national interest or not, or should it be done, or was it illegal? And there were laws that were waved about as being possibly relevant, like the uh, uh, international traffic and arms regulation and, and things like this. And so uh, we were um, told that maybe there, there would be a violation of some law if we were to chip this memo around. And so we had the MIT lawyers look that over, and finally in December of 77, they said, it's okay to mail it out now. So we mailed out uh, lots and lots of copies of this memo to people who had sent in self-addressed stamp, stamp envelopes based on Martin Gardner's column. And uh, so that, that got out. But, uh, so the, the publication there was Martin, Martin's column, and then the memo were the first things. And then there was the communications of the ACM article that appeared in uh, 1978. Mm -hmm. And since this memo went out widely, um, did, was there immediate, any immediate impact? Um, there was lots of interest, yeah. Pe people were interested in this. So some people got interested in the implementations, the possible applications. Um, it was tough to, in spite of the, the wonderful setup that Diffie and Hellman had made and the technology that seemed to work, um, it was tough to see how to make the transition uh, to practice. Computers were very slow then. I mean, if you think about a VAX back in the day, trying to find a large prime number, uh, it really took quite a long time 
uh, many minutes, maybe half an hour in some cases, to, depending on how big the prime was. Uh, and so the practical aspects of, of this were uh, daunting at the time. And plus the integration with various systems and, you know, the, the internet existed, but the web didn't exist yet. Uh, and so applications were, were sparse. Uh, so it took a while for some of this to settle in. Plus, I think it takes a while for people to get their head around a new idea and, and, and just sort of understand its implications and how it might fit into their existing systems. Had, had, had the three of you and maybe some of your colleagues and people that you discussed it with been thinking about concrete applications of, uh, of well, that? Well, I, I think the concrete applications, first of all, were in some, to some extent f sketched out in the original Diffie-Hellman paper. Yes, right. Uh, you know, and I think talking to your stockbroker was, was one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think secure email, secure phones were the kind of thing that, that uh, struck us as being the most likely first areas of first application. And, but you obviously recognized that the sort of feeble computers you had available at the time were going to make that a challenge, at least in the short run. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, the implementation efficiency was definitely a concern. And one of the interesting things that happened about that time was uh, MIT got involved with VLSI. So VLSI at the time had been entirely a black art in the industry. Uh, there was little academic research in, in VLSI design. And finally, MIT said, this is something we should do. There's enough interest and in, interesting questions here and complexity that we should uh, take this in and make it a research area at MIT. So they brought in people from industry to teach us how to do VLSI design. And, and I glommed into this saying, yeah, we should learn this. We should figure out how to make an RSA chip. And so the technology at the time was really primitive. I remember taking a class where uh, you would pull out these sheets of red uh, cellophane and, and you'd take your exacto knife and you'd cut out the little mask and you place them down. And those are used to the photograph to make the mask for the chip. It was just a horrible <laughs> technology for doing anything of scale. Uh, and so um, we took the class but said, you know, if we're going to do an RSA chip, we're not going to do it that way. And, and we continued to explore making an RSA chip, and we did. Uh, but instead, we wrote Lisp programs that generated the masks, uh, and so we used the Lisp machine, which was that was there to, to produce these masks, and they were all computer generated and, and uh, simulated on, on the on the computer. One forgets how yeah. Uh, yeah. how <laughs> primitive the technologies were in in those times. Um, so I guess it's natural to ask when when did practical use of of RSA actually begin? Practically, that's a great question. When uh, the first I mean, we tested it, certainly, writing messages to each other and, and doing things like that. Um, but in terms of commercial applications, so I guess the practice followed a path that I guess many companies' uh, applications do. We started off with the idea, and then uh, MIT decided to file for a patent. So they said, this looks like it might have practical application. And I'm not quite sure how they made that assessment. But uh, they just said, yeah, looks, this looks interesting enough to file a patent for. Mm -hmm. and, and so there was a patent filed. And that um, wasn't granted until 1983 or something like that. There was some interference with the Stanford patents on their, on their work, too. That took a little while to resolve, but that got sorted out eventually. And then uh, uh, in 80, about 83, we decided that this looked like it was commercially viable. Uh, we weren't quite sure how, and we didn't know much about business, but we decided to set up a company to, to explore that. And so we did. We uh, created RSA Data Security, and Len was the first president of the, of the company, uh, even though he, like us, Adi and I, knew nothing about business, really. And we started to explore uh, applications. And the first thing that we had in mind there was uh, secure phones. So uh, that was not... Um, a market which we knew a whole lot about, but we said we, we can make this work. And so it involves some uh, you know, encoding and decoding of voice with it, with it, crypto and so on too. And uh, that turned out not to be where the market really was. Mm -hmm. uh, that didn't work. Um, we had some difficulty with a supplier of, of the chips that we wanted to make. They were sort of based on the original RSA chip we did. Uh, so the chip uh, fabrication route didn't work. But as that was happening, you know, the, the whole world of general purpose computing and software was taking off too. We weren't quite to the era of the, the web yet, but uh, the internet was, was starting to take off and the idea of encrypting uh, products, uh, encrypting uh, messages on the internet uh, started to seem more and more real. So in 86, uh, the company about went bust. We weren't making any money. Uh, we got Jim Bidzos to, to uh, take over the company and we changed the management structure. And uh, he was a really great, uh, insightful, and smart uh, businessman who had a lot of 
technical depth and understood how to close a deal and started uh, talking with companies that uh, you know, might uh, do it. I think one of the early licensees was IBM uh, Lotus Notes. Uh, was was one of the uh, the first products that got signed up, but it was it was uh, difficult because there weren't too many products yet that uh, required distributed security uh, in a non-military kind of context. So, let's go back just for a minute um, to the secure phones idea, which yeah. didn't work out. Yeah. Um, but the concept of a secure phone already existed at that time. The military was using. I'm sure they had. We didn't have much contact with the military. conventional encryption. Yes, um, yes, and key management. Key. key management got. Is, I mean, the whole point of public key cryptography, of course, is key management yes. simplification, and, and so you could exchange public keys, uh, possibly having them signed by a, a central authority, and, and establish keys in a, in a nice way that way. Um, so this would simplify those kinds of things. We we, we did not talk with um, uh, manufacturers of secure phones at the time that I recall. We were just going our own route and, mm -hmm. and trying to do that. There were other things too. I, mean, I remember um, talking with one company, Delco, I think it was, that wanted to put uh, RSA into door locks for cars. Uh, and they said, well, this doesn't work fine for that. I wasn't sure the application was a great fit, but they said, well, if you can make it for under 10 cents, we'll do it. <laughs> you know, as, as usual, in the car industry, everything has to be really, really cheap. We said, there's no way that's going to happen. That was probably an easy question to answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that didn't go anywhere. Yeah. And so this is right around. The, the mid 80s or maybe getting in the mid 80s later. Yeah. so yeah. so we, we now have we are sort of in the era when when microprocessors were beginning to come to be readily available or at least yes um, yes so so things were getting um, more and more feasible to do on general purpose microprocessors um, in the early days it, the, the again the implementation expense was uh, was uh, large I remember, remember the prime finding issue one one letter I got was a guy who was uh, setting up in business to sell prime numbers because he thought they were hard to generate. So he, of course, buying your crypto key from somebody else makes no sense whatsoever, but this is what he was doing. And he had separate prices for you know, two-digit primes, three-digit primes, and four-digit primes. You know, <laughs> well, all sorts of people out there with strange business ideas. Yes. <laughs> that's amazing. But even, even with the, the CPUs of, of the late 80s, you would have needed a, a, a dedicated chip to do the to do the not necessarily right? you, you could do so, well I mean the encryption is, is basically a singular modular exponentiation and so that's whatever it took it might have been a, a minute or something like that um, the um, uh, keys the, finding the keys and so on was a longer operation to finding mm -hmm. the prime numbers and so on but that only needs to be done once so that was, that was mm -hmm. not so much of, a, of an issue um, but computational efficiency I mean it's amazing how the, how much faster computers have gotten since, since those days <laughs> yes I mean, indeed look, look what you can do in your laptop now and what was possible back then um, and uh, so now now you know encryption is, is you know public key encryption is doable it's you know, blazingly fast in a tiny fraction of a second but then it was it was an issue and uh, so we've seen the evolution of the computing power uh, you know have its impact on public key cryptography and, and uh, uh, I think this will continue we'll have uh, EV schemes now that seem complicated will you know become easier to implement as, as we get uh, more tightly integrated computer systems, and maybe Moore's law is over, but uh, you know there's still lots of lots of uh, gains that can be made in implementing crypto in special purpose ways for for some of these newer ideas that have, have come on the on the scene. That's a topic I want to come back to a little later. Sure. Um, but uh, at the moment, I'd like to try to stay with the chronology roughly. Yep. Make sure I understand how that that unfolded. So, um, you mentioned that MIT had filed for a patent. Um, yes. Uh, around the time of the original work. Uh, I guess the end of '77 or so, um, and the patent didn't issue until until '83. '83, yeah. Um, and, which is also about the time that the that you guys started the company. Was that coincidental? Uh, no, not entirely. The um, I think that uh, I'm not sure there was a causal relationship there, but it, it, it seemed it was synergistic. Um, the company was founded, it obtained an exclusive license from MIT for 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 the uh, patent. I and, see. And uh, so it was one of the. Basis for going, then being able to go out and raise, raise some funding, saying, you know, we've got some assets that we can, uh, you know, uh, ex exploit and try to uh, move the market forward. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and MIT was okay with the idea of having these three professors go off and, and at least part time be working at this company as well. Or MIT has always been very favorably disposed towards uh, entrepreneurial activities on the part of its faculty. I mean, it's a clear line to say, you know, your primary obligation is to MIT, 
but if you're doing you know some amount of time uh, on the side doing this, and it really didn't take a lot of time at the early days because there wasn't much much happening at first. Uh, there was no market really quite, so it was trying to figure out right. uh, what to do. But uh, MIT uh, does have policies of, of supporting entrepreneurial activities on the part of the faculty. Faculty typically take time off and, and go off and do a startup or something like that for a year or two. Um, usually not more. I think more than two is not allowed, but uh, up to two years. So, in fact, I didn't take any time off to to work on this. It was. Uh, uh, lightweight enough in the early days that uh, um, it wasn't necessary, and after that we had a good team uh, at the company itself. Uh, it's very interesting to to hear. I mean, we're talking about more than 30 years ago now, and to hear how that compares with perhaps the way things work today. First of all, five years from from uh, patent filing to corporate creation would be an eternity by yes. today's standards. Yes. Um, <laughs> but that was okay then because yeah. there basically was no way to implement um, yeah. from what you were just saying. Um, yeah, we were way ahead both of the implementation, uh, good implementations uh, in terms of the hardware being uh, available, and the market. The market didn't really happen until the web happened, mm -hmm. and uh, so it wasn't the 90s until things really started opening up. So you were exploring, in the context of the company, you were exploring both um, making concrete products and licensing. Yes. technology. Yes. Um, and it yeah, the focus like ended up being on the licensing primarily. So. so um, Building up software libraries, implementing the crypto, turned out to be one of the major uh, business sides of RSA then, rather than the chip. The chip didn't uh, go anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but the software packages did. Uh, they turned out to be essentially what was needed for IBM or Mozilla or other companies, Netscape, to, to, to put into their product and, and make these things work. Mm -hmm. so. And given that the work had been you know, had been done in 77, and this memo that you talked about had gotten widely circulated uh, shortly after that, even though the patent didn't issue for a long time. Were you concerned at all about being scooped by somebody else? Um, there's lots of things to be concerned about. I mean, there, there's uh, lots of risks with, with the, trying to push out a technology. I mean, there's the risk that, A, the technology isn't what you thought it was, that it turns out to be insecure. It could be that somebody develops a, a great factoring algorithm, and, and so the technology just goes, goes, goes poof. Uh, it could be that the implementation is such a barrier that it's not going to, to be there. There's this, uh, you could be scooped in a couple of ways. I mean, you could be scooped with better algorithms, um, and that turned out not to be the case, at least uh, not for a long time. Now, nowadays, there's interesting alternatives based on elliptic curves and so on, too, that people can use. But uh, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call them better, but they're certainly very interesting. Um, and uh, you know, so there's, there's lots of reasons, why, lots of risks you can have. Uh, plus, like just the complexity of, of trying to explain these things to people uh, with any kind of technology you've got to describe. You know, what, uh, how does key management work? How do you, how, how do keys get from A to B in a trustworthy way? You know, how, how, how do you know that you've got the right key? So, so you, it sounds like you're more concerned about the the actual technical inherent technical risks of it than competitive risk. Yeah, there were no real competitors from a business sense. Um, that it was. Uh, but there wasn't much of a market either, so there wasn't much to compete over yet. Uh, it, it was uh, trying to, it was market creation, if anything, uh, that was the most uh, important part of this, is trying to explain to people what this technology can do and how they could use it and, and uh, develop a demand for it. Mm -hmm. So you stayed involved with the company for a number of years, in the, the early days, but then even after the management got, maybe we should say, regularized a little bit, um, you were you remained involved. Is yeah, that I remained right? involved as as, as a uh, consultant, uh, advisor, board member, uh, you know, for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, sort of tried to work with them, mostly with with Jim Bezos, who was running the company at the time, until the company was sold in '96. Uh, so I was uh, involved with uh, the various aspects of, of licensing and working with various customers and working on the technology, trying to make it better. And as you reflect back on that, well, that was your your first sort of first-hand business experience, I, yes, yeah. I take it. Um, what do you think of the main things you learned from that? Um, so it's interesting, just the complexities that you have to deal with, all, all the, no, the huge array of, you know, from legal to business to technical to funding to, to managing employees to everything. I mean, just the, the range of uh, aspects that a business involves, that it's not just, you know, doing the math. Right. <laughs> That's the easy part, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, of those, of those things, other than doing the math, what what was sort of the most fun, and what part did you not like very much? Um, I, I, I tend not to like situations involving conflict between sure. you know, board members and stuff like that, or whatever that which which we had some of. But um, you know, I think the I actually enjoyed the the variety of uh, issues that we had to deal with. I, I sort of like 
uh, as I said, I went to a liberal arts school. You think of the study of a broad variety of things. I, I like situations that have a diversity of uh, aspects to them. Uh, I guess some of my more recent work on voting has that flavor too, where you've got a variety of things you have to think about. And uh, doing a startup is sort of like that. You have to think about a lot of many different things and, and, and try to make them all synergize well. Um, so that, that was uh, part of it. If you have good people, I mean, uh, working with good people is, is uh, always a lot of fun. And, and uh, if the market's just staking off, that's a lot of fun. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got some fun technology. That's a lot of fun. So, how, uh, how big? How big did the company end up being in people? Uh, at the, well, it grew and grew. I mean, it still exists. I mean, yes. It, uh, at the, the time, it was small until the web happened. Uh, it was only a handful of people. Um, we would have. I remember in the early days, people come to our offices in Redwood City, and it was a small office with you know. Uh, 10 or 20 people in it, and they say, oh, this is a nice branch office. Where's your main office? <laughs> and I said, this is it. So it was, it was small for quite a while. We were, it was really, I mean, there was no, not much revenue for a while, and we were living on the, our investments and, and a small amount of revenue we got until, mm -hmm. until we had some, uh, some real market penetration later on. Got it. I guess one thing that, uh, I want to move on to talking about some other topics, but yep. the last one I want to talk about in this this area was that uh, in the late '90s, I think '97, if I if I got that right, um, it became known that work on a very similar algorithm had been done by Clifford Cox in in yes. the UK, yes. but working for uh, GCHQ, GCHQ. And, and it was of course all That's classified. Correct, yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm not sure when they announced, it might have been 97 or 99, I don't remember the year. But anyway, exactly. a long time after your work. Yeah, so it, the, the announcement came long after. They, they uh, um, announced that they had invented um, in secret in, in their work in GCHQ uh, the idea of public key cryptography. I think they called it non-secret encryption, uh, something close to RSA. It wasn't, it wasn't quite the same. They had, they had the the modulus both being used as the modulus and the exponent or something, the Clifford Cox, but it's essentially the same idea. And also something like the Diffie-Hellman key exchange idea as well. So, so they did a number of things. Uh, as far as I know, they never did anything with any of those things. They wrote them up, so these are interesting, put them back in the drawer and, and never uh, uh, worked on, on exploiting uh, them either commercially or in the military sp space, as far as I know. I don't have a security clearance, so I'm not sure but my, what I know is the full story, but they, uh, uh, as far as I know, didn't, didn't do that. And it might have been because the military needs are different than commercial needs. I mean, in a more hierarchical situation, the need for public key is perhaps less than, than in a more uh, free-floating free kind of commercial scene. Um, might have been the implementation uh, difficulties they found daunting, too. I don't know. Well, if it was earlier than, than yeah. you, and you found it daunting. Yeah. Imagine that probably was the case. Um, did you ever have the opportunity to, to talk with Clifford Cox? Briefly, yes, I met him a couple of times. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. Tell, tell me about uh, that. It was a brief conversation. I mean, at the time, I think he was talking about his uh, newer ideas on identity-based encryption. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's done some, some additional work since, um, but uh, didn't talk in any great detail about the, in, the, the inventions that they had made too. And I'm not sure to what extent he was able to talk at the time. So, uh huh. Yeah. No hard feelings, though, no as far feelings, as you can yeah, tell. Yeah, yeah. Interesting work, yeah. Yeah, that's a, a strange thing when, when you, you know, priority and in invention somehow isn't discovered as a result of things like yeah. security uh, yeah. issues. Yeah, if they'd published at the time, it's not clear what would have happened. I think it really, um, having a company and things like doing things like that really made a difference. I mean, you, it took a lot yes. of work to take these ideas and get them out there. The founding of the RSA conferences, uh, for example, was, was a big step forward in trying to get these out. So there are a lot of things that were had to happen in order for these ideas of public key cryptography and the, the RSA algorithm to sort of take root and, and uh, just having the ideas is just the first step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, of course, cryptography has a lot of applications and uh, yeah. it's not uh, necessarily an end in itself, um, but it's an enabler for a great number yes. of other things. And you've done quite a lot of work in computer security, including most recently, I guess, the work in in voting, which we're going to talk about in more detail later, yeah. but excluding that for the moment, um, what do you what do you th thinking back on the work that you've done in computer security that maybe took advantage of cryptography, or, or maybe didn't? Wh what do you think of as, as your significant work there? So most of my work uh, in I mean computer security stuff is um, I mean there's, there's things I've done that re don't have any crypto in them at all. 
uh, or very little application. For example, there's this work on the game called Flip It that I did with uh, RSA Labs, um, which is sort of a stealth game. Where, so you want to know when you should change your passwords. So you model that and you say, well, there's somebody who's uh, got the possibility of stealing my password, and that's his action. And I've got a, another action I can take asynchronously where I can reset my password or change it. Um, and uh, so maybe when you change it, you find out that it was stolen, say. Um, and there's a question as to how you model this and how you mathematically uh, do this. So that, that's a non-cryptographic kind of scenario where you're modeling a game between a, uh, an adversary and a security, there's always an adversary of some sort, uh, and, and the, the person with the password. And you're trying to figure out how to, how to model that. And that, that's, a, um, you know, again, a mathematically modeled situation. Uh, game theory is the core of it. A uh, new kind of game theory because it's sort of continuous time, partial knowledge. Um, mm. And uh, so that's one of the things that I think is one of the more interesting computer security kinds of um, aspects of it. But I did a number of uh, pieces of work, many of it, much of it crypto based uh, with the folks at RSA Labs too, because I continued to work with them on the security issues. Um, most of the other work I, I did was sort of more pure crypto or something at, at MIT. Um, so work on, uh, some of, the, some of it derives from the policy issues. For example, um, and this continues today with the, with the Crypto Wars 2.0, uh, you know, should law enforcement have access to uh, plain text and so on too? And we did, went through this debate back in the 90s uh, and, and earlier, and uh, there was the whole Clipper Chip uh, episode too where uh, the FBI and law enforcement suggested that everybody should have their chip uh, implementing the crypto. And uh, so some of the work I did on crypto then was, uh, I don't know if you call it, I guess it's more crypto than computer security, uh, say with Mahir Bellari, was, was this notion of uh, translucent crypto. So you can have a situation where the law enforcement gets access to a certain fraction of the plain text. And you can turn a dial that controls the fraction. So you're trying to resolve a hard policy debate. You can say, well, do they get 60%, 20%, 90%, 10%, so on too. There's another dial you can play with. So some of these questions of hard policy questions, you can try to turn into uh, technical questions and say, is there another dimension on which you can play this game? Has any of that caught on? No. <laughs> the, debate, <Should> it? <laughs> the debate continues, but uh, those particular ideas haven't caught on anywhere. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, the, coming back to flip it for a minute, because I read, I read that paper and I thought it was very, uh, very intriguing. Um, and it seemed to me that uh, maybe a little ahead of its time, um, given that that work I mean, today, it, passwords are a major problem, right, for people. Yeah, yeah, it, it uh, uh, has application. Uh, we've had people talk to us about you know, trying to apply it here and there. Uh, there's a lot more theory that can be done, too. Uh, it's an in interesting framework, sort of a new area of, in terms of game theory, I think, that uh, hasn't been well explored yet. And so we've taken some initial steps at, at doing this, and I think uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fun problem and, and uh, could have some impact on the road. Anything else in computer security that you'd like to highlight? Um, Probably not, probably not. Uh, and I teach um, computer security and, and crypto both, but the computer security side of my work is, is probably smaller than the, the crypto side. Mm -hmm. um, there's, we had this dichotomy, sort of almost a two cultures kind of situation with cryptography and computer security. Cryptographers like to live in this ideal world where Alice has a key, Bob has a key, they can keep their key secret, uh, they can work with those keys and encrypt mail and so on or whatever. Uh, and so the fundamental assumptions that are made by the cryptographers tends to be this ideal world where people can generate secrets perfectly well, they can keep their secrets perfectly well, and they can use them without disclosing them and, but through leakage and so on too. The real world is much messier than that. And trying to actually generate good secrets on a computer, to keep them secret on the computer, and to use them without disclosing them inadvertently somehow is, is uh, much harder than... than uh, we think so. Uh, there's, and we're learning how to do that. It's, some of those problems, right. of course, are non-technical, right? Um, some of them are non-technical. So, but many of them are technical. I mean, leakage questions. How do you implement uh, implementation of RSA so that it doesn't leak information by the time that it takes to encrypt or the power that it uses during the encryption? Things like this are, are aspects of leakage we hadn't thought of at the time and, and, mm -hmm. and now learning how to, to do better. But so the the instantiation of this ideal world in, in the real world where we've got real computers with real power usage in real times, things like this, is, is a, and, and, and real uh, questions of you know, protection, isolation of, of processes uh, so you can keep secrets is a hard one. And, and so computer security has a lot to 
do yet to make crypto uh, as usable as it should be. We have seen some progress though, right? I mean, we actually have machines that ship with a secure computing base of, of some sort. Yes, um, we've gotten better. It's become, become more the norm. Um, how well it's used in, in, uh, in the wild is perhaps open to question, but yeah. at least the, the, there's a, f a flat rock to stand on. Yeah, we have, we have, we have made progress, absolutely. As I looked through your publication list, I was struck by the fact that while there were obvious uh, focuses, foci of activity uh, and, and technical area, there's a sort of continuous background of, of other topics in, in research that don't necessarily relate to, to crypto or security or, or later voting. And I was intrigued by the breadth of those. Um, You've, I found that you'd publish papers over over several decades in in computer aided design algorithms for routing, uh, computer architecture itself, a lot of work in machine learning, which goes back I think into the 80s, um, yes. e-commerce. Um, talk talk about that that space of things and and how you. I think to a, to a algorithms person or a theoretic person, I think these are all sort of applied. Computer science, right? So you have you have uh, situations where a little bit of mathematics and, and algorithmic thinking can be be useful. Um, the work on machine learning was was a big piece of work that I did. I after I got tenure, I decided that uh, well maybe I should do something rather different and and uh, take some risks and, and do something uh, quite a bit different than what I'd done before. So I decided the machine learning would be the uh, thing that I would try. I had done, as I had said earlier, some work with the AI lab at, at Stanford as a graduate student. I had some interest in AI then. Uh, it's certainly one of the big uh, challenges of the, the century to try to figure out how to make s smart uh, machines. And uh, so I said, well, I'll, I'll spend some time looking at that. And uh, so this is driven by these fundamental philosophical questions, but, but uh, technically they end up being instantiated by questions involving particular classes of functions to be learned and so on too. Les Valiant had done some seminal work on uh, prob probably approximately correct um, learning uh, a little bit earlier, and that was a nice framework to work in. Um, and uh, learning of automata and stuff was, was some of the work that I'd, I'd done with uh, some students, uh, particularly Rob Shapiri. And, and uh, so there's a lot of fascinating questions about taking a machine learning scenario, trying to model it formally, trying to come up with good algorithms, trying to prove they're effective, that, was, that were of interest to me. Um, and I, I really much enjoyed working on, on those, those kinds of questions. I must say, though, that uh, after a number of years of working on the machine learning things, I found it to be somewhat less satisfying than the work on crypto, because crypto has this wonderful flavor of bridging theory and practice so nicely. I mean, you can, you can take a crypto app, uh, application, you can design an algorithm for it, get the security pieces together, say, for an auction or something else, and then it immediately it can be applied. Um, machine learning at the time was much more theoretical. Uh, it was much less applied. Uh, trying to find good data sets, trying to measure how well you were doing in any kind of application was tough at the time. It was changed a bit since then, but, but at the time it was, it was tough. And so I was a bit dissatisfied with this being sort of more uh, theoretical um, work without any uh, suitable practical foundation and, and trying to assess how well you were doing at the, at the time was, was, uh, was tough. Uh, so I, I drifted more back. And besides, I, the, the work on crypto and security never stopped at, at quite either. I was sort of always in my foot in that, that uh, bit of work, and, and so I sort of got pulled back into that more full time as time went on. But uh, the machine learning work I, I still uh, have an interest in. It's, it's interesting. Is there a, is it, there's sort of a fundamental difference there too also that inherently uh, in the world of crypto and, and what I might call more conventional algorithms, you actually get to prove things. And it's a little harder to do that in the machine learning world yes. where things are inherently probabilistic. Yeah, the probabilistic, uh, the metrics as to how well you're doing, the metrics that really matter are those, you know, how does the world work in the real world on these yes. real data sets? And those real world data sets may not have good theoretical models. So results you prove about a, how well an algorithm works on a theoretical model may not have any relevance to what happens in practice. Exactly. So yeah, it, it's, it's exactly. tougher to... So maybe there's, a, maybe there's a sort of fundamental difference there. In fact, that kind of, maybe we can digress for a minute on that topic, the, the, the notion that uh, Algorithms work as it as it was when you were, you know, a graduate student and a and a, and a starting out professor has sort of 
changed in the in the modern world where there's so much more probabilistic stuff. There's so much more. A lot more probabilistic stuff. That's correct. Yeah. Lot, so much more work in, in and, machine learning. And how do how do we how do we deal with that? And when we're trying to, in particular, teach students that, you know, getting things right. Well, what does it mean to get things right? Yeah, that um, that's an issue I'm struggling with actually right now. I'm um, planning to write a new chapter for our algorithms textbook on machine learning. And it's exactly those questions that you've raised are, are you know, does, does it even fit within the al classical algorithms textbook? It, it, you know, it, it's getting it right is, is uh, uh, not like it is for finding a shortest path. It's meaning you know, finding a good uh, hypothesis out of a hypothesis class that fits the data well and so on. So I, I think it, it fits, but it, it, it's a different level of uh, abstraction. Yeah, I think the sort of the evolution of what it means to be an algorithm has, has been yeah. rather interesting. I remember hearing a talk by John Hopcroft uh, in which he basically said, I started out my career doing graph algorithms and um, in those days graph algorithms meant something with 10 nodes. <laughs> and he said, none of that is interesting anymore. The only things that are interesting are, are graphs with large numbers of nodes, millions of nodes. And the algorithms that you, that you look at are fundamentally different. The way you think about them is fundamentally different. Um, I wonder if the same might be true when it comes to the, to the machine learning and the probabilistic world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, what we're seeing is, is the success of uh, probabilistic methods and the success of uh, large-scale computational uh, machines to, to do this. I mean, I think that the stochastic gradient descent and algorithms like that are, are really carrying the day in terms of uh, being effective at machine learning. Uh, and these are kinds of algorithms that you couldn't have implemented a decade ago probably efficiently. And, and uh, the, the ambition with which the machine learning folks are applying these ideas to, to modern practices is uh, quite incredible. I was very much impressed with the uh, um, work that Google did on the, on the uh, Go playing program. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I played a lot of Go as a graduate student, so I can appreciate the, the, some of the subtleties of the game and the, the, the Go playing uh, program that they, they evolved through these machine learning techniques are very, very impressive. And it's hard to explain what they're doing I mean, in some sense. I mean, they're, again, you don't, you're not designing an algorithm because you know how to solve the problem and you're trying to capture how to play well. You're designing an algorithm that's capable of learning how to play well by playing against itself in this case. Mm -hmm. so. Back to uh Back to the movie War Games, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the textbook uh, in passing, and I wanted to, to come sure. back to that. Um, in its third edition, it sounds like a fourth edition might be fourth on the way. Fourth edition is on the way, uh, we hope. Yes, um, so planning it. How did you get involved with, uh, with Corman and Leiserson on that? So uh, at MIT, uh, we have taught a variety of algorithms courses. So Charles and I and the faculty were, were teaching 6046 at the time, which is our basic algorithms course. That course is now splintered into 6046 and 6006, which uh, is a, a sophomore level course. And Tom was a graduate student at the time uh, helping to teach the course. And we, uh, as usual for courses at the time, we had course notes that were evolving. We had to, every lecture had its, you know, 10 pages of course notes that were written up by either a TA or, or the faculty. And, and uh, they sort of evolved towards a book. And at some point you say, well, you know, this should be a book. And so Tom and, and Charles and I said, yeah, let's, let's turn this into a book. Um, little did we realize how much effort that would be. Uh, <laughs> it took a long time to get the first edition out and, and uh, ready to go. But uh, uh, it uh, eventually happened. So. so there were other algorithms textbooks around at the time. Um, aside from just wanting to have your own, was there another thinking about a different slant on it, perhaps, than the existing books? I think the level of presentation, I mean, I think the care with which you go through the proofs and, and uh, the presentation of the algorithms, was, it's, a, it's a fatter book. It's, we go to, we explain things in a little more detail than some of the other textbooks do. Uh, if you want something that's for a much more advanced student that just gives some of the intuition, you know, there are other textbooks that might be better. But uh, for an introductory textbook, I think we wanted to just hit the nail on the head for, for a student who's never thought about algorithms before, explaining, laying things out, all the, all the details. And so I think we succeeded at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, was there any sense that just the, the level of preparation that an undergraduate coming into MIT would have with respect to computing was changing? Or was that not a factor? Um, that keeps changing. Uh, it's hard yes. to tell what to expect out of students coming into an algorithms class or coming into MIT. Now, MIT is struggling with a question at this time as we speak, even with the question as to whether we should have an introductory computer science course for all undergraduates. Uh, whether they're CS majors or not. Uh, but many students do come in with a background in CS and some programming um, or some familiarity with computers and so on too. Uh, in terms of how it impacts our 
textbook design, um, you know, we were presupposing not much. We were presupposing maybe an ability to program a little bit. Uh, the idea of looking at a piece of pseudocode and understanding what that meant in terms of an algorithm uh, had to be either covered in parallel with teaching the algorithms or uh, preparatory to that. So, mm -hmm. uh, but we wanted to stick at the level of pseudocode rather than writing a book about, say, Java. So you made a couple of um, passing remarks uh, previously about your work in voting, and I'd like to spend some time talking about that now. Uh, sure. The I went back and looked at the papers that you've written, and the earliest one that has the word voting in the title is, I was intrigued to notice, is entitled The Business of Electronic Voting. Um, and that made me wonder, how did you get interested in the topic in the first place? So I, I think the interest in voting arose out of sort of general crypto protocols, right? So cryptography has evolved from just being about algorithms to being about applications that have interesting challenges technically to them. And so there's lots of um, things you can say, well, could you do this with crypto? Can you do that with crypto? So payments, for example, is one of those that, that mm -hmm. come up all the time. We see a resurgence of that recently with Bitcoin and, and, and things like that. Um, but uh, even payments you know, have been around in the literature for a long time. Uh, and there's lots of other protocols uh, that may be some of them more abstract, like oblivious transfer, and some of them more applied, like, like payments or, or voting. So voting has, has been an interesting application area uh, for cryptographers for a long time. And uh, so I taught a crypto class where that was of interest uh, way back when, I back in the late 80s maybe. Um, so, so that, uh, you know, say, can we vote somehow? And I know Josh Benelow was, was interested in these things and got uh, involved with some of that way back when, did a thesis on that. Um, so, you know, voting has is, is, uh, been an area that said, you know, can you do it? And voting has got challenging aspects to it. Voting is, is because of the secret ballot. Uh, and that's the one thing that's really unique about voting. It makes it hard uh, is, you know, protecting the privacy of the vote. Um, and that's important. We can talk about that more if you'd like. But uh, because of that, the, the, the difficulty of implementing a voting scheme is, 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 is large. And you have, you have to think about how to approach it in a way that doesn't allow somebody to, to sell their vote. And selling votes has got a long history in the United States. Uh, it's a great <laughs> book you can uh, uh, recall, Steal This Vote, I think it is. But it, it's about selling and buying of votes. Um, and if you don't design your voting system right, you can have all kinds of corruption. Um, so uh, your interest in this goes back further than just this paper, which I... Which I uh, yeah, I don't actually remember, remember that particular paper. I'm not sure what's in that particular paper. Uh, uh, so we'd have to go, go back and look at that one. But I, I haven't had an interest in voting for a long time. Um, and and uh, early on... It was both the, crypt the design of cryptographic voting schemes, how do you implement a scheme that would work for, for uh, voter based on cryptography, and also uh, from a fairly early stage, the auditing of elections. How do you audit an election to, to ensure that the outcome is correct? Mm -hmm. And they sort of go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Well, as you just said, that um, voting is a, is a unique problem in, in some ways, partly because of the secrecy, yes. secrecy of the ballot. Um, I think that people understand that computer security and cryptography and are going to be tangled up in electronic voting, whatever that means, but, but they don't really understand maybe what the core issues are. Could you, could you talk sure, about that? Sure, yeah, and I think uh, just to reflect on what you said a little bit too, I think you know, voting is sort of particular in a democracy in the sense that you sort of want to have everybody understand what, what's going on. Indeed. Uh, you don't want to have to trust the experts or trust the technology any more than you need to. Um, and so to the extent which you bring in complicated technology or complicated crypto or something like that, it may be inappropriate, at least for certain populations, because people don't understand what's happening. Um, but uh, the core issues for voting, I mean, you need to have you know, some control over who's voting. You want to make sure every person can vote at most once. Uh, you want to make sure that their vote is private. Uh, and that's the, the key issue with the secret ballot. Um, and then you want to have some verifiability that their vote actually counts the way they intended so the phrases I like to use are cast as intended, collected as cast, and, and uh, counted as collected. Um, and you want all three of those steps to be verifiable. So paper ballots turn out to be a marvelous technology for voting systems. People often are surprised that you know, I come from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and I'm, I'm a fan of paper ballots. But uh, <laughs> it's really the best technology out there to, for, for voting. Uh, you, you can mark the paper, you fill in the ovals, and you can see how you voted. It's verifiable right there, whereas seeing what bits are recorded inside of a computer 
uh, are is really tough. You can't you know, a computer can tell you it's recorded X, but it's actually recorded recorded Y, and so they're much harder to evaluate. This is why we're having problems right now in Pennsylvania, which is a there's a recount going on in Pennsylvania as we speak, um, or I think it is. Uh, and parts of Pennsylvania have paper ballots and parts of paper Pennsylvania don't have paper ballots. And those that don't, it's really hard to figure out what a recount should mean. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of technical issues, obviously, involved in this. And there are also a bunch of non-technical issues, which I think you alluded to by saying that people really ought to be able to understand these systems even if they're, if yeah. they're not technical. Can you can kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, voting is interesting issues? because it's, it's a nice mix. It's what uh, some people like to call socio-technical systems or whatever. This is a, there's all kinds of considerations that come into play. Um, the, the technical ones are uh, having to do with, you know, the, how do you represent the ballot? How do you tally the ballots? How do, how do you confirm that the ballot tally is correct and so on? But there's uh, lots of other issues that come into play too. Cost, uh, usability, understandability, uh, things like this are, are certainly, uh, you know, accessibility are, are part of the, the picture too. And so voting turn, turns out to be one of the more difficult uh, technical systems to, to build. And the secret ballot is, is the one that really makes it the toughest because you can't use a lot of the same auditing techniques that you use with other systems because you can't uh, keep a, a, a tight coupling between, you know, who put in this vote and what the vote is. Uh, it's it's got to be somehow disconnected a bit. Are there any analogs in other uh, societal areas that we can draw on? Not very much. I mean, people often say, well, I can bank online. Why can't I vote online, for example, or things like this, which is, uh, doesn't follow I right. mean, because of the difference between banking and voting. Banking doesn't have a secrecy requirement. Or people can say, you know, if I can put a man on the moon, why can't I, you know, um, you know do vote online or something like this? Um, but again, you, Putting a man on the moon. There's not people shooting at the rocket while it's going up, and the voting <laughs> system, is, is, as we've seen recently, yes. may be subject to attacks. So um, you know, it's, it's got to be a highly secure system, uh, understandable system. It's got to have all kinds of verification capabilities designed into it. Uh, so a paper ballot system that's that you fill out the paper ballot, you scan it with an electronic scanner, uh, you have the paper ballots, you can recount them if you need to, and you can randomly sample those to audit them if you need to, uh, is, is probably in today's world the best choice. But there are some other areas of society where we try to legislate and enforce privacy, um, and in some cases with, with technology involved, I'm thinking of medical uh, information. Is there anything we can learn from that? Uh, it's hard. I mean, I think that um, medical, uh, they're, they're rather different. I mean, medical um, uh, systems uh, have different notions of privacy than you do in the voting system. Voting system is just how did person X vote, which is all you care about. A uh, medical system, you may care about a variety of different systems. You may want it private to the outside world, but not private to the doctors and, 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 mm -hmm. and so on. So there's various kinds of disclosure you may want to have, uh, disclosure rules. Um, uh, there's nothing quite like voting in terms that we can leverage off of. Uh, it's, it's We have the tools that we can, you know, confidentiality per se is, is a grand goal of security and of cryptography. And we can use some of those tools to achieve a level of voter privacy in, in a voting system. And there is this realm of what's called end-to-end -end voting systems, which I've worked on and other people have as well, where you have a, a voting system where you protect privacy cryptographically, the voting privacy cryptographically. So when you casting your vote, you're casting a, crypto, a ciphertext. Um, and uh, so you have a, a process of casting the vote, which cr involves creating the ciphertext and knowing that the ciphertext rep actually represents your vote. And then the ciphertext being a ciphertext can be posted on the website next to your name. So I can say, you know, so-and-so voted this way, but it's a cipher enciphered this way. And so there's a uh, collected as cast check you can do. Then you can say, did my ciphertext make it to the pile of votes to be counted? So you can see my name is there and my vote is there. Uh, and then there's a tally that's produced and you need to know that the tally is, is uh, the proper tally for that collection of ciphertext without decrypting everybody's ciphertext. Uh -huh. uh, this can be done too with a little crypto magic, say using homomorphic encryption of some sort. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's some, some technology there for doing it. So, so there's some nice tools for um, applying cryptography to voting as well. They're taking us off in a different direction. And some of these uh, schemes are in fact being deployed and, and used as we speak. Um, Tacoma Park, Maryland has had some elections using some of these end-to-end -end schemes. Uh, 
past a few years, and uh, uh, Travis County, Texas, is implementing a scheme called StarVote, which implements some of these kinds of ideas as well, both paper ballots and the cryptography. So um, we're learning as we go along. We're learning how to take this, these cryptographic ideas, these ideas of verifiability, and deploy them in, in real-world systems that are both uh, secure and usable in a nice way. So I think, I think we're making progress, but slowly, in the voting arena. But people keep pushing for things which are, I think, at this stage, not really possible securely, like internet voting. And, and uh, so I, one of the things I do is I spend a bit of time talking with people about the risks of internet voting. And I think we're just not there yet to be able to do that securely. So it would probably be helpful to, to contrast electronic voting from internet voting specifically. Yeah, electronic voting is a sort of a vague term. It sometimes exactly. means internet voting as well, but electronic voting often refers to just a, a machine where you're recording your vote electronically. What's called, called a DRE in the, in the voting world. So direct recording by electronics. You touch a touch screen, your vote gets recorded some, somewhere in the innards of the machine, and you have no idea if it was recorded properly or not. There's no verifiability of, of that vote. Mm -hmm. um, so bo electronic voting has its own problems, uh, and so it doesn't have a tangible record of how, how you voted. Um, but internet voting is even worse in the sense that you've got uh, people voting on all kinds of machines, their, lap their own laptops, which may have malware on them. You've got the internet to deal with, you've got denial of service attacks to deal with, lots of other things. So, so it's a, um, again, as you say, when people, when people uh, say, well, you know, I can, we can send a man on the moon or I can do electronic banking, why can't I, when I can, can I do voting online? It's the it's the uh, these verifiability uh, issues. Verifiability, really some of it, yeah, 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 and, and having um, and some of these things are scalability and having having a robustness under attack too. I mean, I think it's really um, you know if you've got a server that's collecting votes on election day and the server goes down because of a DDoS attack, you know, you're sort of hosed for that election, uh, and and uh, so and there's no reason to do that. I mean, one of the questions you should always ask about a proposal like. That is, why do you want to do it? And people often propose uh, answers like, well, it'll increase turnout, or uh, people will like it, or something like that. And um, the first of which seems to be false. Uh, the evidence we have is that uh, putting something, a voting system online does not increase turnout. In fact, it may increase, make decrease turnout, that uh, people are unfamiliar with the technology, they have an awkward time. There's lots of people who don't use the internet much yet, mm -hmm. and, and things like this. So it, uh, putting a voting system online may not increase turnout. And uh, once people start talking about the security issues, they're wary of it and they often prefer to go vote on paper. So you'll have a political party saying, don't vote online if you have the option. Go to the polling site, and go early, go early vote, vote on paper. So, uh, you know, there's, there's reasons, both security-wise and ease of use and so on too, that, um, you know, I think people find uh, for voting by paper rather than voting uh, online. So uh, it'll be a long, maybe someday, you know, maybe we'll have secure enough phones down the road that we can do that. But uh, you're, you don't want to be in a situation where you're trusting a particular vendor or manufacturer to count your votes. Nevertheless, there are vendors and manufacturers out there purveying equipment that people yes, in yes. authority buy, right? Yeah, if you're in the voting business and you want to make a buck, you, you uh, may take on some responsibilities. You shouldn't be taking on some, some responsibility that you're not actually ready for. Are there any good examples that we can point to, perhaps outside the United States? There are examples of people attempting things like internet voting outside the United States. In Estonia, for example, the security evaluations I've seen of those by people like uh, Alex Haldeman and, and so on to say these systems are, are really not ready for prime time yet either. Mm -hmm. Are there systems that are, have been demonstrated to work in any reasonable way, perhaps on smaller scale than something like a United States national election? I mean, there are uh, systems that use some of the principles I've talked about. In Israel, for example, there's the so-called Wombat system developed by uh, Alan Rosen and others, which involves paper ballots, but they have this end-to-end -end cryptographic flavor to them. So you get a, a paper receipt that's got uh, two parts, one of which has uh, the candidate's name you're voting for, and you put that in the ballot box, and the other part has a QR code that you can take home and validate as on the, uh, on the web and so on, too. So there's schemes like this that uh, I think are, are very promising and have been used a bit. Um, but these are not online voting systems. These are poll site voting systems still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, get more into the question of future directions for voting, but before we do that, um, I want to come back and ask for your perspective uh, more broadly in the area um, of computer security. Um, 
I found a, an interview that you gave almost almost a decade ago in 2008 with Dr. Dobbs and had a, an interesting exchange in it talking about credit cards. Uh, they asked you uh, the following. A Nielsen survey released March 12th of 1997 showed that people fear buying things on the internet because they don't think their credit card numbers are safe. Uh, I'm a little puzzled as to why in 2008 they asked you about what a study 10 years before said yeah. about buying habits on the internet, but we'll, we'll ignore yeah. that. I, it's your answer that I found interesting. You said, they're probably safer using their credit card for internet transactions than they are using it at a local restaurant. It's a question as to what the risk is. The risk in a restaurant is that the waiter or waitress you give your credit card number to, copies it down, keeps a copy of the carbon, whatever, sells it to a friend, my personal guess is that this is more likely to happen in a restaurant than on the internet. Not that the situation couldn't turn around at some point, but currently the number of credit card thefts carried out over the internet is probably very small compared to the number carried out in ordinary institutions like a restaurant or a shopping center. So now it's nearly a decade later. Um, the world has changed quite a bit. Um, I'm not sure that the situation has improved, at least not in US restaurants. Um, what are your thoughts on, on credit card security and the tie-in with computers today? Well, we've gotten better. We're, 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 you've seen all the chip cards come out now. So we have, instead of the mag stripe cards, we have the, the chip cards and they uh, promise a, a step up in terms of security. Uh, it provides a, a proof of possession that you don't have with the, the mag stripe card quite so much because the mag stripe card you can copy and, and uh, uh, easily you take, the, take the old iron out and take a Make, make tape and put it over your card, just copy the, the bits easily. Um, so I think we're, we're getting there. Uh, we haven't moved to the chip and pin level of, of uh, technology yet where you have to type in the pin as well. But, uh, uh, you know, by and large, the security, the, the fraud departments at credit card companies have gotten very good. And I think a lot of the security we have now comes less from the technology of the card as it does from the, the ability of the fraud departments to say, You've never shopped at this store before, and moreover, you shopped at another store, you know, 100 miles away, you know, two seconds ago or something, you know, or whatever. And, and they, they understand weird buying patterns much more readily than they, they used to. They, they pay attention to those things. And those matter. So it may be that the it's not the technology of the card as much as it is the, the, the ability of the fraud department to very quickly see that this, this is an irregular purchase and should be denied. Um, and, and I suspect that has a lot to do with it. Plus, they make a lot of money, and they, they're willing to take some losses, as always, and, and uh, that, that makes the system work. So that raises a couple of other questions. I think uh, maybe this is an application of machine learning that uh, is yep. helping them to do this. Um, I don't know, but it wouldn't, wouldn't Probably surprise it is, me. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's an economic calculation, obviously, for the, for the credit card company, um, which has to factor in a, some, I would say, somewhat intangible issues related to how much of the f risk is borne by the merchant versus the credit card company, which varies in different parts of the world. Uh, different laws uh, apply. But the other thing is the inconvenience for the customer when, when uh, a card is compromised. I mean, yes. it's all very well and good to say, well, we'll send you one you know, express mail overnight. But if you're traveling in in Western China or something, uh, that might not be quite as convenient as you had in mind. Um, you yes, might I had this happen. Then I, was, I, was, I was in Ireland and had a card stolen at the time. I'm was, sorry, say again. I was in Ireland, or no, I was in Iceland once, and I had a card stolen, and uh, very inconvenient. It was a, exactly, a exactly. Fraud. So you you probably weren't so happy with whatever decision no. they made uh, that allowed the fraud to, to occur. Yeah. Um, so th there are trade-offs there, but it's not it's not immediately obvious to me, at least, that there. Um, factoring in considerations that are of paramount importance to the customer. Well, I think they don't want to lose customers, so they, they'll, they'll, they, they understand the actuarial. You know, this is why they have you know, so many tiers of, of risk, you know, 22 tiers or something like that of different mm -hmm. kinds of uh, discount rates for the merchants and so on too, with different levels of risk and, and uh, you know, customer service relationships, uh, customer service departments that are uh, well-staffed and ready to help out quickly if they can. So they don't want to lose you as a customer. Um, it's it's a it's an actuarial game. I mean, it's it's a kind of thing where you've got remedies for situations you can handle. Uh, and again, back to voting. This is one of the things that makes it different than voting, in the sense that you know once the vote is cast and it's broken, it's tied with you. You know, there's there's no there's no remedy if something goes wrong. You don't know what's happened to your vote quite necessarily. 
and, and uh, you know, there's, there's no way to fix up a, a broken election. Whereas with a broken credit card uh, transaction, it, it's, uh, yeah, maybe they can do something. So I think that actually leads pretty nicely to the next thing you said in the Dr. Dobbs interview, mm -hmm. which was that security is a cat and mouse game. You can't afford perfect security. Companies make investments to ameliorate the risks. Over time, the technologies improve. It gets harder for the bad guys. Breaking into bank, bank vaults isn't done very much today. It's gotten really hard to do. It went through a series of stages, and now you've got vaults that are really elaborate. We'll see the same evolution with internet security. Have I, we? I think we have. I think we have. I mean, I think uh, now we've gotten to the point, uh, for example, with uh, iPhones, where they're really quite secure, and so, back, so much so that law enforcement is complaining about the security yes. and that they can't uh, get into them when they feel they need to. Right, which raises a, another interesting topic that I hope we'll talk yes. about a little bit, a little bit more. Um, so it, it seems that um, on electronic voting, um, coming back to sort of where that's going, um, if we if we look at the history of introduction of computer-based or computing-based technologies into mainstream society, we often see that they start out as fairly inferior solutions. Um, that work well for some portion of whatever problem they're trying to solve but don't address the other. And then over time they get better and adoption increases and eventually the, the old solution maybe doesn't go away but gets down to some relatively low level of use um, as, the, as the good stuff is, is made better and the, and the bad stuff is more or less dealt with. Uh, do you think electronic voting can, will follow a path like that? It's harder, I think, because... Um you don't want to be in a sort of a trust me situation with with the the voting vendor and the voting technology. So you know, the question is, who are you having to trust in order to trust the election outcome? You know, so if somebody says uh, so and so won the election, well, maybe it's believable, maybe it's not. But if you believe it, who who do you have to believe in order to do that? Do you have to believe the manufacturer of your smartphone that they've actually implemented something secure and haven't tampered with the like if your if your smartphone was manufactured in China or the Chinese? You know, did they put something into the phone that might have uh, interfered with your vote? It's not beyond the pale. We've seen Android phones recently, which uh, ship a lot of the call data off to China, you yes. know, unbeknownst to the to the owner. So, so that having a, a manufacturer of a, of a phone put in uh, some malware that could affect the vote is entirely uh, plausible. Um, so we've got those, those issues to deal with. Uh, but things are getting better. Uh, but technology is very complicated. I mean, having a voting system where the number of lines of relevant code is larger than the number of voters seems, you know, a, a, a dubious kind of thing in some ways, right? <laughs> you know, you've got a typical commercial code is three bugs per thousand lines mm -hmm. or something like that, too. So you, and these, each of these may be a security vulnerability that allows you to change the vote. So you've got to be very careful. That's one of the reasons we introduced the notion of software independence. The, John Wack and I wrote a paper uh, a number of years ago which defined software independence as a, system, a voting system as software independent if uh, you know, an undetected change in the software can't tr cause an undetectable change in the outcome. And basically says you're not dependent upon the software being correct in order to confirm the outcome. So things with paper ballots have that property because you can, uh, even if the software and the scanners were manipulated with, you've always got the ability to go back and look at the paper ballots and see what the correct outcome is. So uh, I think that software dependence is a key notion you'll want to have for a voting system. And that's hard to do with an all electronic system because the evidence that you've got uh, is in bits, it's tamperable, it's manipulable without the voter being able to verify them directly. So um, it's really pretty tough. Right. Well, this was this end-to-end -end argument that you were talking yeah, about before. Yeah, the end-to-end -end argument has a place. Can, can get, get, get around some of these things. Yes. Um, on on the need for improvement in voting, which may not necessarily mean electronic right. technology, um, in 2012, you and, and a number of other distinguished scientists sent a letter to uh, President Obama on the need for voting Im improvements. Mm -hmm. Did you get a response to that letter? We didn't get a response to that letter. No. But, How uh, disappointing. I, th I think. Uh, the current election, the 2016 presidential election, uh, maybe will have more long-term impact on voting uh, as we move forward. People will understand that uh, to the extent that we have systems that are online or electronic, they may be vulnerable to foreign actors trying to manipulate the vote. Um, uh, the Russians may have interfered with uh, not only email but possibly voting systems. Uh, you know, there's no 
uh, evidence that I know of yet that says they did, although they did inter interfere with the people's email systems. Uh, but we see that the vulnerabilities that we see in all the other realms of commerce, you know, the Target and other companies being, uh, or OPM being, being uh, hacked, um, you know, could easily happen to a voting system vendor or a voting jurisdiction. And so the sensitivity, the, the vulnerability of our systems to uh, uh, hackers of various sorts has, has become much clearer in this, this current election round. The need for, in my mind, paper ballots and good auditing techniques has, has become even clearer. Mm -hmm. We always have irregularities in elections, right? Yes. Um, just thinking back over the U.S. elections that, that I recall, uh, there's always something that comes up, and it usually seems to me that it, the noise dies down relatively quickly after the election about whatever the irregularity was, because either it wasn't really an irregularity or it didn't actually make much difference. And so this whole question of making much difference is in some sense related to what I think you know you've been talking about recently, and that's the auditing yeah. uh, uh, of elections. Could you say a few words about that? Yeah, so I, I think that uh, one of the things the uh, election should do uh, is not only produce the correct outcome, but produce evidence that that is the correct outcome. And so you uh, want to check, you know, uh, does the evidence trail support the outcome that was announced? Is the reported outcome the correct outcome? And uh, so that's a, a great question. And you can turns out you can do such things efficiently with uh, uh, risk limiting audits and, and things like this that have been evolved by uh, Philip Stark and, and others. Um, so the idea is that you want to be able to take a statistical sample of the paper ballots and, and do some statistics on them, on the sample, to see whether uh, the outcome is consistent with that sample. Um, maybe the result is that you need to enlarge the sample because the election's close, but uh, you know, typically they'll say, yes, it's right, or it's wrong, or, or maybe take more data. Um, and so that's an area of, of interesting research as we speak, and one where I'd like to see more legislation supporting of, uh, of audits afterwards. I distinguish an audit here from a recount, whereas an audit typically means a, a statistical sample of some variable size, perhaps, uh, whereas a recount is a, a sort of by definition recounting all of the ballots, and it's quite expensive. But an audit can be very uh, simple. The last uh, presidential election that we just had, uh, Philip Stark and I made some estimates of how much work it would take to audit, uh, say, the entire country, state by state. And, and a state that's got a reasonable margin of victory for one candidate or the other is very cheap to audit. For example, California, uh, looking at 70 randomly chosen ballots out of the whole state is enough to sort of, should be enough to confirm the, uh, the outcome. 70? 70? 70, 70, 70, 70, yeah. Yeah. And how many votes are there in California, know, roughly? Millions, right, yeah. So, yes. so it's a, that's, it's a very, that's amazing. That's amazing. It's very simple. You just sort of say, you know, if somebody tampered with the ballots enough to cause the outcome to be wrong by that much, they would have had to tamper enough that 70 ballots would have discovered the discrepancy somehow. So That's amazing. So, yeah, so, so statistical techniques can be very powerful, as we see not only in AI, but also in voting here. Yes. And, and uh, so uh, getting an efficient audit, I think, on the books as, as part of the law required as, as part of the basic practice, the good hygiene that you want to do with every election would be uh, something I'd like to see happen. So what do you think are the prospects for, for having auditing become a, a sort of a standard part of the election process? I think they're not too bad. Um, there, it's certainly the right approach to take. And so there's certainly a technological compelling argument to make that this is what you should be doing. And I think part of the difficulty is just affecting that change, uh, convincing people that it is that it does, does work, it can be done fast. Um, and uh, you know, getting it on the books to say this is legally required. Um, change is hard in voting systems. People, uh, people are elected, don't like to change the system they were elected by. You know, um, there are constraints, calendar constraints and so on too. People want to know the result right away, so putting in something that happens after election day that still tries to confirm the output, confirm the outcome, uh, can, can be uh, you know, controversial or difficult. But I think, I think it can be worried. We're starting to see that Things starting to happen in various states now. A number of states have various kinds of auditing requirements. Uh, they're not always as mathematically uh, tough as you'd like to have, but they're examining a, a number of randomly chosen uh, ballots. Um, I think we'll get there. So I'm, I'm, I tend to be optimistic that this is the, the right direction to go in, and that over you know, another decade maybe we'll see it all fall into place. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I wonder if the wonder if there were to be principled opposition to auditing, what it would be? 
I think the arguments that are made are, are typically things like, you know, it doesn't fit in the calendar or something like that. It, it's a, you know, it, we, there isn't enough time between the time the polls close and between the time you want to certify the elections to do the audit. And uh, I think those things can be worked with. I think that's, that's sort of the only principle that I can see that's valid. Um, you know, the fact that uh, you know, if you don't have paper ballots, I mean, you've got other issues to deal with. I mean, you've got to have a foundation of something to audit that has sort of the ground truth in it that the voters have looked at. So the security fundamentals say, you know, you start with the evidence trail that the voter has looked at, and you know the voter's verified, and that gives you the, the ground truth, and then you just want to compare that ground truth against the machine interpretation of that ground truth, what the scanner said, and that can be done efficiently. So I think the, there isn't any real basis for a principal opposition to this. Um, unless you have uh, already, for example, doing hand count everywhere. So I see that some, a few jurisdictions count all of the ballots by hand for the first count, and that's uh, a pretty good process, and that may, not, that may be a principal reason not to bother doing a sampled recount uh, again, perhaps. Yeah, it's interesting. We're, we're perfectly willing to have elections drag on for weeks when, when they're so close that we need to have a very careful recount. Yeah. But when you, you might have an election be a, be a few days or a week longer just so you could be confident yeah. that you didn't need a recount, that, that seems a little odd that you could object. Yeah, right. There's lots of, lots of things that need to be improved in our voting system. Hopefully we'll get there. I mean, it'd be nice to have a national holiday for election day. It'd be nice to have nonpartisan districting uh, rules set up and so on. There's just lots of, lots of ways to improve voting still. So make our democracy work as best as it can. That's obviously a long and complex yeah. topic and one that will be yeah. under discussion probably forever. Um, I want to move on to another thing, but since the voting stuff is such a recent uh, area of interest and one that, that has obviously got a lot going on, I have to ask you, um, just for, in terms of your own personal research, where do you see that going in, 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 the, in the voting area or maybe, maybe in other areas uh, over the next few years? So in the, in the voting arena, the, the two things I'm working on uh, at the moment include, um, well, there's some, some things that's pure policy things. So it, the idea of internet voting keeps bubbling up, and I keep trying to push back against that and explain to people that this is, we're not ready for that. So that's not research per se, that's sort of just sort of advocacy. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the research, um, there are uh, interesting ideas that I'm exploring with Phil Stark and others on auditing elections. Um, and there's lots of interesting deep te technical questions there, particularly as you get into um, non-plurality elections. So if we have instant runoff voting, for example, uh, where you list your preferences, and then there's a complicated algorithm that says, you know, how the, those ballots are combined to come up with a winner, um, that may be the kind of election system you want, but then you can ask the question, well, how do you audit that such an election, right? And if I give you a sample, how do you tell what to do with a sample? And so there are, we've got ideas on how to handle that, but, it, but it's, it's real research there that needs to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. Also in the, in the cryptographic uh, realm, the end-to-end -end cryptographic schemes, I think there's a lot more to be done there to try to simplify and make those work as, as, as well as we can. Um, and I'm optimistic about the uh, StarVote project in Travis County, which sort of combines some of the auditing ideas, some of the cryptographic ideas and so on too. So we've got some practical experience to gain with those and then maybe some redesign to, to make those kinds of systems work better. But uh, uh, so applying cryptography, applying statistics to make uh, the integrity of elections be really what it should be is, is sort of the, the high level goal. Well, and there's lots of work to do, as you lots said. Of, yeah. <laughs> I want to come back to uh, what really was the, the motivation for this uh, interview in some sense from the beginning, which was your the fact that you won the Turing Award with your colleagues, mm -hmm. Lennon and Adi. Um, now that was in 2002, if I remember correctly, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so a certain amount of time has gone by since then. Um, but that's time to sort of reflect on the impact that that might have had on, on your work and your, your career and the way you interact with the rest of the field and the world. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so the, the Turing, you're talking about the Turing Award per se, is it? yeah. Yes. As opposed, not as opposed to the RSA uh, algorithm itself. You know, the Turing Award is, is a, a nice recognition of work, of work done. Um, it certainly uh, highlights things that are uh, impactful and have importance to the field. Uh, cryptography is certainly, as a field, um, blossomed and had a lot of, uh, both theoretically and practically, uh, in computer science uh, since, since the early days. I mean, it, it's really turned out to be a nice bridge between 
a lot of the practical aspects of the field and some of the theoretical aspects. It's had connections with complexity theory and so on too. So, so I think uh, in some sense the award is in part a recognition of just the importance of cryptography to, to, uh, to the field um, and being an early contributor to that. And we've seen um, the Diffie-Hellman uh, paper also get a, a, a Turing Award more recently, which is nice too. So I think there's a lot of uh, conceptual and, and theoretical things happening in the crypto field that uh, are, are just very important, and, and I think it's good to see uh, get recognition. I think it um, helps, helps emphasize that security and cryptography are issues and, and technologies that people need to uh, understand. I mean, we talk about educating the next generation of computer scientists and, and uh, so on. It's nice to have uh, um, you know examples of, of technologies that are not too difficult to understand. I think RSA is an example of that, actually. Um, that uh, give real impact in terms of security and, and, and so on too. So I think uh, just the, the, the recognition, the highlighting of, of both the field and the particular technology is, is, uh, is nice to see. Uh, I'm not sure that's responsive to your question or not. I, 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 well, that's certainly, certainly relevant. Um, I was wondering if it may have had any more personal impact on you in terms of what you've done in the last uh, decade and a half or so. Um, I think my work has sort of pr proceeded along the same kind of trajectory it would have anyway. I mean, I think the kinds of questions that my research has, has followed it hasn't changed because of the Turing Award. I think it's, it's, a, it's a nice recognition to have made, but it, it doesn't uh, raise new technical directions for me. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I could probably give more talks on, on, uh, on, on the older work uh, because of the Turing Award. But uh, the new directions, I think, even with voting and, and some of the cryptographic applications to voting and things like that are, are still the same. Do you find it opens any doors or has opened any doors that might not have been opened otherwise? Um, I don't know about doors, but it's recognition that it's, it's nice. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, um, there is the uh, new uh, Heidelberg Laureate Forum that uh, ACM sponsors. And it's, yes. it's very, very nice. And so I attended those once, and that was uh, nice to, to, to meet uh, other uh, award winnings there, uh, either uh, ACM Turing Award winners or Nobel Laureates and so on, too. It's just a fantastic event. So it's a uh, uh, wonderful way to get together uh, with, with people who have also won similar awards, and also uh, the young students who come to that. It's a very nice uh, event for, for students and postdocs that come to that. Yes, absolutely. I think it's a yeah, great yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. I think sometimes the, the benefit of these awards comes in the fact that not so much people in the field who already know about and appreciate your yeah. work, yeah. but people outside the field, it's, it's a, a kind of a funny, uh, for want of a better term, certification yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. that says this is, these are these are people who know what they're doing. You should pay attention to what they say. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you maybe you can leverage that in the voting area. I hope so. I think some of that helps. Yes, <laughs> it does definitely. Yeah. Um, I thought maybe we could wrap up with a couple of um, maybe speculations about some some uh, aspects of computer security that uh, are with us today and likely to lead us in interesting directions. You've already alluded to one of them, which I'm hold off for a moment. I'll talk about the other one. Um, the notion of digital certificates, which grew out of the cryptography work and is very mm -hmm. important. Um, cer certificates are everywhere. You know, every time you use a web browser, there are a zillion certificates running around. But I, I suspect it's the case that most people who uh, <laughs> spend lots of hours every day in a web browser have no clue about certificates, what they mean, what they're being used for, or any of that. Um, first of all, would you agree, and is that a problem? I do agree. I'm not sure it's a problem. I, mean, I think that um, you know, the question is, what are the aspects of security and cryptography that need to be in your face when you're using these systems, and which were the ones that are better under the hood? And uh, so when so, you know, certificates sort of play a role of the glue of, of putting these things together. So you want to have a, and I think we're still a long ways from having a, a PKI that really works for everybody. I mean, it's a, the binding of names to keys, the questions to who has authority to do that binding, uh, what happens when keys go bad, uh, and how you revoke certificates and so on. There's a lot of detail that has to do with digital certificates that uh, uh, we're still not handling as well as we should. And uh, you know, I've spent some time over the last decade thinking about some of these issues and trying to come up with better systems, and it's hard. I don't have any proposals to put on the table yet, but it's certainly things I've, I've got ideas about, and I think it's, uh, um, it's challenging because it deals with um, many aspects of security that um, are sort of f fuzzy uh, almost. I mean, who, who, you know, who has the authority to, to 
to do a certain to make a certain assertion. I mean, do I have a uh, the authority to assert that your key is such and such? If so, what strength should somebody give to that assertion? Uh, and and uh, you know, maybe if it's a corporate relation, we've got other certain kinds of rules that that uh, affect this. If if it's a personal situation, it's something else. So there's lots of uh, aspects to this that, that make it. Uh, Complicated, and then when things start going bad, you know how you trace out the consequences of a an attack, and you, all of a sudden you think that is a certificate that's gone bad. Somebody's discovered the private key, and then but he's signed off on that on other keys. How do you, how do you how do you find uh, all the consequences of that? So it's a it's a complicated situation. So uh, that complexity, much of it should be hidden from I think the typical user. Uh, you want something that's sort of simple, you know, a little lock icon that goes on. Uh, user interfaces for security is, is a um, area which I, I haven't studied deeply, but there's a lot of surprising things that happen there where people just don't pay attention to things. You know, they they uh, click on uh, banners that come up just to make them go away without reading them, and, and so on and so forth. So I think it's uh, uh, designing a security system that minimizes the amount of complexity, the amount of understanding that a person needs to have, and does succeed at getting their attention when it's important to get their attention. Um, it is, is uh, still. A, I, I you know, things, surprising things still happen. I was at a website just uh, a couple of days ago making a donation, or I thought I wanted to make a donation to this organization, and then I realized their site was totally insecure. They, they, they had no uh, HTTPS on, on their site or anything like this. So, you know, so you question is, what do you pay attention to, and, and uh, when, when does it catch Most your eye? Most people would not notice, I imagine. Yeah, probably most people would not notice, but I, I said, I'm not making a donation this way. You know, so I, I wrote a check. <laughs> <laughs> paper again. Paper check, yeah, yeah back to paper. It does seem. It does seem. You know. You said maybe this isn't a problem, but the whole complex of things. Maybe the underlying certificate technology is nice and solid, but the way in which it's deployed and the way in which people interact with it, it sounds to me, is less than no, ideal. I think the underlying technology is not philosophically well founded yet. Uh, I mean, the whole names. The question is, what's the namespace for a certificate? Yes, is, is uh, not well thought through. Uh, I mean, a hierarchical namespace doesn't make sense for the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I've got to work on that. I did some work way back when on this thing called Spooky Sudsy, which sort of tried to do a, a different take on some of this. And I think there's some good ideas there that, that should play a role in a, in a future system. Um, but uh, uh, you know, the, the current framework is, is uh, works OK for e-commerce. And it sort of falls flat anything when you try to go push beyond that at all. Uh, you know, putting certificates for you and for me in, in, a, in a personal sense, you know, we're just not there. Mm -hmm. So. E-commerce, e you has the advantage that you can put a put a quantitative value on, on, a value on, on the loss that you can, might sustain as a result of something. Yeah, like well-defined companies and, and, and uh, yeah. yeah, so business units that you can yeah. you can certify. Yeah. So the other topic that I wanted to come back to is one that you've already mentioned, which is this this question of uh, of key escrow by supposedly yes. trusted authorities, um, and you know the tussle, for example, between the government and Apple over the the iPhone yes the iPhone security. Um, and I think you recently published, or maybe it was last year, an article in, in the communications about the issues in, involved in key escrow and, and about balancing legal and individual yeah, so there, rights. There, say some things about that. So this is an issue that's uh, persisted throughout the development of cryptography. Um, uh, law enforcement in particular has determined that, uh, perceived that, that cryptography uh, makes its job difficult or impossible in certain situations that they have a uh, perceived need or authorization to to uh, access certain information and the cryptography just doesn't make it uh, possible to, for them to do that. Um, and uh, so they, they get frustrated and they push for laws or help somehow to do this. Uh, back in the 90s, they, they had a proposed solution. They said everybody should have the clipper chip and the clipper chip should have an escrow key in it and every time you encrypted anything, a copy would be shipped off to uh, law enforcement as well. Um, and that was uh, blown apart by Matt Blaze and others who discovered serious technical flaws with, with the uh, proposal. Uh, more recently, they, they sort of say, well, we're not going to propose technical solutions. Um, you know, you guys are smart. You should figure out what, what uh, should be done here. But uh, you know, they don't even define the problem. I mean, if you're asking for solutions, uh, the problem is not well defined. Uh, who should have access when? What kinds of uh, things? What's plain text? What's ciphertext? You know, for example, there's a, a classic technique for um, erasing data. You encrypt the data, the data can be backed up in encrypted form nicely. You know, this is a nice way of handling the erasure of data because when you want to erase that data, you just erase the encryption key. 
Okay, so that's a nice way of making the accessibility of the data go away. But now you're in a situation where you've got ciphertext on your machine, which itself hasn't been erased, only the key has been erased, uh, and you don't have the way of decrypting it. So now you're probably in violation of, of whatever laws that the FBI wants to have or something like that because there's no way that they can get access to it either. So is it going to be illegal to erase data? I don't know, what, you know what's, what's, the, what's the right uh, way to think. So there's lots of different angles to this. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like saying, you know, ball bearings are problematic for law enforcement because they allow bad guys to go fast. Uh, you want to have some regulation of ball bearings. Uh, well, that's a kind of complicated thing to ask for, you know. And crypto is like is in the middle of everywhere, just like ball bearings are in the middle of everywhere. Uh, and trying to figure out all the different places that crypto might apply and how you might regulate them, there's a lot of detailed thought that would have to go into that. So I, I think that regulation of crypto is um, very, very complex, much more complex than law enforcement probably realizes. And it's probably unworkable in, in the end. Uh, and, and uh, having other approaches to have help law enforcement get the information it wants is, is perhaps the better approach. But it's a difficult situation. There's certainly societal trade-offs to be made here. And other societies have made different judgments. Britain, for example, recently has passed their Snoopers Charter, which basically says that you know, the government has to have access to all encrypted communications and so on, too. And I doubt that's going to work for them, but we'll see. Seems like the, you said you know, the problem is necessar not necessarily well-defined. Um, might that be because the, the problem stems from a pile of assumptions about how the world ought to work that may not be universally shared? Uh, law enforcement has certain assumptions about what data ought to be accessible to them that might not be shared by the general population. Um, and, and that means that you know, a solution, when you come from different assumptions, is not a solution at all. You know, I think even defining what, it, what a ciphertext is and what the plaintext is is hard. I mean, you've got I see. encrypting keys, encrypting other keys. You've got keys encrypting maybe random data. You've got situations where a secret is split among a number of parties, any, several of which can decrypt it. Um, you know, there's lots of uh, situations where uh, the cryptographic complexity and the layering of, of at levels of abstraction really comes into play. and makes the situation very complicated um, that, uh, such that you know, trying to figure out, well, which applications of cryptography uh, are those that should be accessible to law enforcement. I mean, it's not clear. You've got places where you've got using things called encryption algorithms, but they're not used for confidentiality. They're used for authentication and things like this, so maybe that shouldn't be covered. I, you know, you've got to be very careful about defining all these. Maybe it's approachable, but I, I, I think it's, it's uh, you know, require a massive amount of work on the part of every sort of tech company that's doing anything with security. So it's, 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 it's uh, makes me nervous that this could throw a lot of sand in the gears of technology. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Let me ask you one last question, which is really more a question of um, perspective for the for the future computer scientists, if we will. Sure. You know, where where do you think that um, the opportunities are most likely to lie for people who are thinking about going into computing today? Uh, it's a great question. I mean, it, it, the field is surprising, and, and like most research, I guess you, there's surprising consequences to research that you may not uh, think is would. You know, maybe it's something that seems like it's a small problem may turn out to have uh, a lot of interesting consequences down the road. Uh, you know, Adi Shamir and I did this um, work on rewriting write once memories once that sort of seemed like a cute little problem, and we showed that you know, by if you've got a memory unit where you can only change zeros to ones and you can't change them back, you can in fact store a lot more data on, on such a memory unit than, than you might imagine. Um, and uh, so we wrote a paper and it, had, it, was, it was a nice theoretical result. It turns out much later we learned that this has had uh, quite an impact on flash memories and how they're used. You know, and, and so the, there's, there's a, a lot of um, surprising consequences of work. So I, you know, I think that you know, just sort of following, being persistent about taking a problem, following it through, trying to see where it uh, where it goes, and, and uh, you know, sometimes the, these things are not to be have had more impact. I think that, uh, uh, to my taste, the, the looking for the intersection between applications and theory is, is a very fruitful area. The applications that come along, or that keep coming along, are uh, always posing new problems in security or, or theoretical computer science. I you want to say well, what. Uh, what, what's the theoretic? How do you take this problem that's a problem in practice? You know, maybe something new, something to do with social media or something that's relatively new. And you say, well, how can I formalize that? How can I 
uh, ask a theoretical question about that, and then try to develop a theory around that. So that's the kind of work that, that appeals to me, and I think that can be recommended to, to new, new computer scientists or saying, you know, let's, let's try to look for the new applications, but then try to step back, abstract them, say what, what's really being done here, what's, what are the, really the hard questions, what's the hard part of this, what's the easy part of this, can, can we come up with good algorithms or good, good approaches to the security of this. Um, so I think that uh, deriving your motivation from things that people care about in the real world, but then stepping back and saying, you know, can we do a, a theoretical approach, analysis of, of the situation, is, is a, a nice style. And that's what we see, a, a theory side of computer science to a lot of, and it works pretty well. Great, thank you very much, Ron. Thanks.